inviting us here, Matt. Um, pleasure to be here. It's a real shame we're not doing a live workshop, um, but we will do our best, given the circumstances, to try and really have like a hands-on clinical feel of what gait analysis can, can do for you and your practices. So understanding the way that a person walks or runs, we know provides invaluable information in treating patients with musculoskeletal and orthopedic conditions. And due to the nature of distance running, the impact of kinematics on the development of common injuries, we know that it's a really useful tool in treating injured runners. And today we're gonna to be talking through a couple of really insightful case studies to show the role that it can play in helping treat these people. Um, but before we do that, we're actually gonna begin by reviewing some of the gait analysis technologies that are available to clinicians and summarizing the advantages and disadvantages of each of these. So in a nutshell, we can summarize gait analysis technology into kind of four broad categories. Um, starting, we have a, a visual analysis. We can look at 2D video analysis. We can do inertial measurement units or IMUs. Um, and then probably at that top tier, then you have the 3D infrared analysis. So we're gonna talk through pros and cons of each one and where they fit into clinical practice. So if we start with the sort of visual gait analysis, uh, the beauty of this one is it's just its simplicity in that it's super quick to do. You only need your eyes and you don't need any equipment whatsoever. You just sort of, with that old catchphrase of, of just say what you see. Um, the issues with it, it can be a, a subjective and experience plays a part. And as we'll find out in a minute, actually, just because you're more experienced, it doesn't always mean you're going to be better at it. Um, if we um, look at some um, confidence data in a second. And then the final thing is, is our eyes don't always tell the truth. And because the gait cycle, it happens so quickly, your eyes can often miss things. So if we look at some of the the data out there, I've just highlighted two points here. Um, and basically, if we look at this, it's basically looking at how reliable and repeatable are we at use, just using our eyes and picking up certain movement patterns, as it were. And they looked at inexperienced, experienced, and then expert level, uh, what they class as expert level people doing visual gaze analysis. And if you take that posterior rotation of the um, pelvis, you actually found that the you had that confidence interval of 0.45. And then as you then got a little more experience, that dropped to 1.3. And then you got more experience, you got an expert, you then pointed up to 0.65. So that was saying that you're okay at it to begin with the no experience. Then you got a little bit more experience, you actually got worse at it, picking up. And then as you become more of an expert, then you actually then got better at it. But then you then look at knee flexion, you can see that trend of the, the more you do it, the better you get. So you just got to be wary of your own limitations in actually what you can see reliably and, and not. Then if you then go on to sort of your 2D sort of video gate analysis, again, it's quick and easy to do with modern technology. Most phones can do it now because most phones can you can record at 240 frames per second and slow it down. Use an iPad, you can use things like Coach's Eye, Huddle, Dartfish, whatever you want really. And that can sort of help just to slow that image down. And it's again, super quick and super simple um, to do. And it is validated for certain parameters and the studies that are validated, they validate it against using a full on 3D system. So there are some things actually 2D gate, 2D gate analysis can be really useful for. Um, however, again, it is subjective. It's still my opinion of it. And you can't see rotation. So unfortunately, you can't draw any angles um, on there and have any sort of confidence that that is accurate data. Um, so but then you've got to weigh up, is that relevant? And you've got to always think about what is it that I'm looking for for this patient or run in in front of me. So again, if you look at this, article here we can see that looking at pelvic drop hip adduction and knee abduction they all found it to be a valid and reliable way when looking at 2d versus um, 
3D in looking at um, runners. So you then move on to, I remember listening to some of the chat this got mentioned already, and I think this is two, three days old. Um, so it wasn't in the presentation. And then it was a quick message Tom saying, I need to get in the presentation. So um, this was uh, by Chris Nathia and Tom Goom and colleagues. Basically, I know it's titled Remote Running Gate Analysis, but I actually like it as a, a nice pro forma if you're doing a 2D gate analysis. So again, as people have already mentioned in the chat, you can then try and make yourself just more repeatable. So you try to do the same thing every time to reduce the, um, the variability. And again, you can see that 2D can pick up knee flexion. It can pick up ankle dorsiflexion, overstriding. Um, you can look at someone's cadence quite reliably. And as Izzy's already said that whether you want to quantify that or not, you could just use RISE. Or if you want to quantify it, you could possibly look at using a, a 2D system to help measure cadence. Though so things like most watches will do that as well now. I think the big thing is allowing that acclimatization. So if you look at the research, is anything from four to eight minutes of running on that treadmill just to familiarize yourself with the surroundings as well, I think is also important. Then you then move on to 3D infrared uh, and analysis, um, just using um, cameras and you, the, the run 3D setup I have in clinic, it's a three camera setup, but then you can get labs that have 12 or or more. The beauty of it is that it's objective, it's giving you physical data, it's giving you numbers. That's so not my opinion of how you're moving, it's, this is the data. We can measure all three planes of motion and we can measure those three planes of motion and sort of look at the sagittal plane from hip down to ankle as one, look at the same with the frontal, same with the transverse. And if it's the most accurate. And then because you then got that 3D data, you can then look at speed and time. So you can start looking at the velocity of motion as well. However, there's some pitfalls. One is the cost. It's by far the most expensive way to do a, a gait analysis. And there is a risk you fall into the old pitfall of you treat the scan, not the patient. It will give you tons of information. And it's sort of our, my job as clinician is to work up what is relevant to that to that patient, okay, they may have some parameters, they may have an appeal of obliquity, they may have a hip drop or something, but actually is that relevant to the injury that they presented in clinic to us, or is it just a bit of a red herring? And it's one hell of a steep learning curve, learning then to interpret what does this data mean, and then how do you then relate that back in clinical terms for your runners and, and patients? And the one thing that we also have to be wary of with shoes, is that all the markers uh, tend to be stuck on the shoe rather than directly on the foot. So when you're just looking at motion, you are looking at what the shoe is doing rather than ideally what the foot is doing. Um, the way to resolve that is you cut holes in your shoes and stick the markers directly to the foot, but not many runners are gonna let you cut their shoes up. Um, so that's why when we do it, we test everyone in the same shoe. So I've just got a, um, just a bank of ISO ride 13s, I think that everyone's testing the same shoe just to try and standardize that the best we can. So we'll briefly touch on IMUs just to complete our review and then we'll focus a little bit more on the 3D and, and how it works. So inertial measurement units are small devices, you can see the XSENS device on the screen here, that are att attached to a body segment of choice. So you can put it onto one segment, you can put it onto four segments, whatever you're interested in measuring. And ultimately they measure accelerations. In order to calculate kinematics then, in order to get date data, we need to integrate this to calculate joint motion. So the big advantage of IMUs is of course that they can be taken outside the lab. So they can be really, really valuable in field testing if you're kind of doing football and game sports and things like that. They're also very accurate, and we know this, for measuring spatial temporal parameters and also kind of gait patterns. So if we're looking for a, a pattern of function or for range of motion um, measurements, they can be very useful in that sense. However, um, the data is sensitive to where they are, are attached on the patient, and it's 
prone to something called integration drift. So they tend to be less accurate than a lab-based system when it comes to calculating exact kinematic data. So we'll move on now to just talk a little bit more about 3D, the science behind it and, and how it works. So 3D gait analysis quantifies human motion by using infrared cameras to track the positions of small reflective markers that you attach to a person as they perform an activity of choice. So walking or running in our case. As you saw from the video on Nick's slide, they don't see the person at all. All the cameras are doing is measuring the positions of those little dots that you attach to the person's leg. We then use that information to input into a lower limb model and from the model, we can calculate 3D joint kinematics. What we get out, sagittal, frontal and transverse plane motion throughout the entire gait cycle. So we're now gonna talk you through a typical patient assessment. I apologize, it's not gonna be quite the same as a real life version, but it will suffice. So after taking a history, a 3D gait analysis system needs to be calibrated. Okay, this takes around 30 seconds, largely involves you being a bit like Harry Potter and waving this wand around in the capture volume. We then need to prepare the patient for data capture. And as we've already touched upon, this involves attaching small reflective markers. We use rigid body clusters that are attached posteriorly onto the straps and also anatomical, land, anatomical markers that are attached onto specific bony landmarks. Now, this is the only input that the clinician has on the results. And it's really important that those anatomical ones are put in the right places. Otherwise you get bad data. So next step is to position the patient onto the treadmill in a standardized position. And we effectively capture a reference trial in this position and we're ready to move on to the dynamic. We actually recommend capturing a walking assessment. Um, not only does this enable your patient to familiarize him or herself to being on the treadmill, and as Nick touched upon, this is really important, acclimatization on the treadmill, but it also means you get an assessment of walking gait as well. They're then ready to move on to the running assessment. So the screen that you can see here is a view that we can make visible to both the patient and the clinician meaning that you can carry out real-time gait retraining. Uh, what the clinician can do is select a musculoskeletal parameter, and this, this is then displayed on that central gray band that you can see in the middle of the graphic. This represents the patient's results in real time, so you can feed this information back to them and ask them to alter it based on kind of gait retraining cues. Once the data has been captured, the markers have been removed, you can then go through the report uh, and we're actually going to go through some really cool case studies in a bit. So 3D gait analysis provides us with the data on 3D joint motion throughout the entire gait cycle. Uh, we typically represent the results as kinematic curves. Uh, Nick, if you can just whiz on to the next one. Sorry, jumping ahead. Um, so we typically present the results as kinematic curves. And these are standard biomechanical graphs. If you've read any kind of biomechanics literature, this is what you'll see. And we typically display it as gait cycle along the horizontal x-axis, okay? So zero represents when the foot contacts the ground. The vertical green line represents toe off. And then 100% represents when that same foot touches the ground again. Okay, so effectively we have an entire gait cycle with stance being on the left-hand side of the green line, swing being on the right-hand side. On the y-axis then, you plot the angle in degrees. And for this particular example, I'm showing sagittal and frontal transverse motion for the, um, for the ankle joint. So we have plantar dorsiflexion in the sagittal plane inversion and eversion in the frontal plane and tibial rotation in the transverse plane. One would usually present uh, control data in the shaded band, which is what you can see here. And then you can present the um, patient's data, specific data on top of that. Now, 
that's a lot of information to take in. It's complicated to understand. It can take years to get your head around those graphs. And so often a more simplified way of interpreting these is to actually take out discrete parameters from those graphs, things that we know have been identified as risk factors for common musculoskeletal overuse injuries. And this allows for a much easier interpretation because you don't have to look at those horrible kinematic curves. Instead, we can look at a single dot that will tell us whether something's within a control range too high or too low. Now, I'm going to go through this graph just because Nick's going to talk through some results and it's really useful if you can understand um, how they're presented. Right is always red. OK, so data in the in the red is always the right leg and blue is the um, is the left leg. The blue triangle represents the left leg. Again, control data is presented in that central black band and we have a plus minus standard deviation there as well. The discrete parameter is then, oh, got on Nick. Right. <laughs> the discrete parameter then is um, explained along the bottom and it's really easy. You can cast your eye over and say, okay, hip A deduction, there's a huge asymmetry there with too much movement on the right hand side. Okay, so it just makes a much easier way of interpreting it. Then I think trying to bring it back to clinical decision making, I still adopt the policy of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, as you can see there, then you will then start talking about symmetry. You can you can pick up asymmetry, but again, it's always asking yourself, is that relevant to the patient that's coming in? Because then in your history, you may find, well, actually, this patient may be a 200 meter runner or they may be a just doing something involves a lot of twisting or turning so actually the asymmetry may be normal for that patient so again it's keep taking it back to the pathology they presented with and can you link with that change in function to that pathology and for me doing gait analysis in clinic it's if you have someone come in and they're a runner and they've run 10 miles and then next week they then decide to run 100 miles they could have the best gait or the bad gait in the world. The odds aren't the gait has nothing to do with why they got injured. It would most probably be more like that they just added 90 miles a week to their to their running. So for me personally in clinic, I, if they've got a trauma, then we know why they've got the problem. If they've been a little silly and um, done too much too soon with their mileage, as it were, or if they're just not doing enough strength training. So if we can tick all those off and they've done all that and they're still getting a problem, then that's when I then go back and then start using the, the gait analysis in clinic. And again, you can then link that back to that excessive or reduced motion. And that again, just keeps coming back to, is it relevant? Yes or no. Um, and then the beauty of the, the gait and that the 3D gait is that planar abnormality. So you can have a look on um, are we seeing the majority of any issues occurring in the sagittal plane or is it in the frontal plane? Because a lot of runners are focused on frontal plane stuff, but actually for me in clinic, I tend to see most issues that occur in sagittal rather than frontal. And you can build that picture up for them and help explain to them and possibly link it back to why they're getting their problem. So if we now look at a couple of case studies, um, so this was a 27 year old female competitive runner, um, sort of a 248 marathon. So pretty nippy, far quicker than I can run a marathon. In. Um, and if you then look at her injury history, it's sort of so down that it's, if you notice it's all down the right side. So in 2007, it is heel pain. Then 2011, it's stress fracture. And now it's more right sided calf and hamstring and IT B issues. Um, and she'd been through rehab, so been through some strengthening stuff. She's had injections and everything in those orthoses, but she still just keeps getting these things occurring on the right-hand side. So then you look at her 3D data, and what you can see here is on the right, she lands on the forefoot. On the left, she lands more on heel strike. Um, so you're starting to see some, some asymmetry there, but then... Again, keep questioning yourself, is that relevant to this patient, yes or no? And then when you then start looking at the other parameters, you can sort of see, okay, there's a bit of an increased pelvic tilt, so it's a bit of a forward lean. 
and then not getting enough enough, enough hip extensions that are okay is she not using the big muscles around her hip region to help drive herself forward is she possibly trying to use the calf too much to get what we call sort of an ankle dominant sort of gait as it were um, and then when you then looked at the strength testing that was done with a handheld dynamometer we could see there was a reduction in um, hip extensor strength and reduced hamstring and quadriceps um, flexibility as well then you can then look at the transverse plane, the one on the far right, the oval shape on the far right, um, this one around about here. Um, we can sort of see there's that high right-sided pelvic um, rotation. So we're thinking that, okay, is she then landing on the forefoot, but then doing that by then every result, then getting that extra rotation through the pelvis and that's the price she's paying for it. And then when you're asking her, she then self-taught herself to run on the forefoot on the right to try and help reduce her symptoms. And as we already mentioned, then that then may have then resulted in the increased pelvic rotation at foot strike. So then recommendation-wise, what happened, moved her more during a rehab phase into a hoka shoe just to try and help with improve that sagittal plane um, function worked on a bit of gait re-education work just to try and see if reducing that asymmetry offered her any symptom release. And as Izzy always mentioned, uh, uh, I think she mentioned sort of rich willy stuff, is that, yeah, if you want to try and change it, change it. If it doesn't make any reduction in symptoms, then move on because it may not actually be related. And then she then went through some strength and flexibility work um, as well. So the big question is, did it work? Um, retested 12 months afterwards and was then back running, I believe got a GB vest um, also. However, it was still running with an asymmetrical foot strike. So actually was the foot strike a red herring or, or not? But the thing that did improve was that pelvic rotation at foot strike and that control through that frontal and transverse plane along with reducing the overshot. But the most important thing out of the whole thing is that she was back running 60 miles a week at a level she likes, competing where she wanted to be without any issues. Then if we then now look at sort of more of a gate re-education side of things. So 47 year old chap, um, chronic bilateral calf and Achilles issues, and just sort of felt that as he is running more, that he's getting more progressive calf tightness that worsened as his speed increased. So again, we look at this chap's data and we can sort of see there's that increased pelvic obliquity and hip adduction on that right hand side, along with increased right sided um, hip internal rotation. So immediately I'm thinking, okay, is there some proximal strength work that needs to be done? Um, here and then there's obviously that's still that, that forward lean then also he's landing with reduction in knee flexion so landing at foot struggle is quite a straight leg and then if we then look at his cadence was pretty low 156 and he was getting excessive plant flexion so you can see as Jess already spoke about that green line there represents toe off and that was happening around about 43, 45% of the gait cycle. So then what did we do with him? It was then going through a gait retraining process. So it was a feed based on feedback and trying to work out which cues worked and didn't work for this chap and it is sort of um, five sessions over a weekly basis just to really try and address that um, that proximal control. And the cue that worked for him was um, faster turnover, so I've increased the cadence, and then tuck, um, tucking your bottom under to try and get in slightly more upright. And then obviously then still combined it with a rehab program as well to work on strengthening stuff. And You'll still see a pattern here that everything that anything I do when I treat someone with the gate net, there's always a rehab program that's attached um, attached with it as well. So 
did it work? Um, we could see that pelvic reduced, the pelvic hilt reduced. So the purple you're seeing is after gate re-education and the green is beforehand. Um, so did we help improve knee flexion at foot strike? Um, yes, we did with that bottom circle um, down here. We can see we're landing with slightly more flexed knee. Did the cadence increase? Yes, it did. And sorry, the green line's missing here, but it was sitting around about 38% of the gait cycle. So he wasn't um, having that prolonged um, contact time. So again, he wasn't having as much of a, what we call ankle dominant gait. And then more importantly, the thing he was able to do is then able to get back to running three times a week without any, any symptoms. So then really looking to sum up really, again, the, the message I, I like to always is, is talk about is treat the patient, not the scan. Um, in that we're, we're not treating, we're not, you've got data, but we have to remember there's a human being attached to the end of this data and that always needs to be taken into consideration. If the gate analysis doesn't show anything, don't, don't worry about it. Don't panic. If it doesn't show anything, it doesn't show anything. And that may mean that the problem isn't kinematically related. Okay, you need to go then go back, review, okay, there's some strength deficits that's being missed. Is there some education that needs to be done? Be mindful of your own limitations um, with the visual gait analysis and the 2D. Just be mindful of what you can and can't measure, what you can and can't see. Be mindful of the 3D of if you haven't got experience interpreting the data it's it's a steep learning curve to then try and get to what that data means for that for that patient and for me it, it still don't forget about the history and the load management uh, as I said earlier before I do any sort of gait analysis I still do all three I do 3D um, 2D and I do visual just because I've got a 3D system in clinic doesn't mean every person I see goes through it because if the history doesn't warrant it, or if there's an issue with load management, i.e. they're just doing too much too soon, or they're not doing their strength work, doing a gait analysis isn't going to offer that patient any benefits, not going to change the treatment. So there's no point putting them through um, that process. So don't obviously go hunting for issues um, just because you got the technology to do it. Um, just use it wisely and use it. And it's like with everything, it's just patient selection. Um, so I think that really sort of summed us up, really. Um, and it's now time for if people have any questions. And I'm impressed we managed to bring that in on time as well. Yeah. All, all our pre-runs have been like massively over just because I'm controlling the PowerPoint and we're sat there trying to. And yeah, so I'm happy that we've managed to get it in in 30 minutes because we had like 38, 39 in some of the pre-runs. So. But it's like Thank exactly, you. not just you got it in. It's like, dink, we're good. Minutes, well yeah. done. It's as if we practiced it, Matt. Isn't it just? But then, you know, the gate analysis, you know, it's what it's all about, isn't it? Precision. Keeping yeah. it in time, precision. So it's, you've done your industry good. Thanks, guys. Very, very, oh, I'm not surprised, but a very, very um, interesting. And he did really well because this was supposed to be live. It's going to be the spectacle of Brighton with the chairs parting and the treadmill in. But I think it was really effective. Um, I might not be convinced about online gate analysis, but I am convinced about talking about gate analysis online. I think that worked very well. It was well done. It was good. Wicked. Right. So, guys, as normal, then um, opening up questions to the floor. Um, there is, in theory, a little hand up button you can press and a blue hand appears. Or you can just get on cam and stick your skin colored hand up. Um, so it's up to you. Um, we have got a question already which um, came in um, from one of our Spanish speaking. So I'm going to read it out for you, if that's all right, guys. Um, here we go. Right, you ready? It's quite long. You concentrating? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do you want in Spanish or English? English. What, the, what does the scientific evidence say about the usefulness of 2D running technique analysis and performance metrics like cadence, vertical oscillation, stiffness, et cetera. So you've covered that a little bit, obviously, in the presentation. But so we're talking about 2D running technique analysis. Are they important to the people who are starting in running? 
Are they part of a battery of evaluations to reduce the risk of injury or to, to optimize the performance of an athlete? Right, so there's quite a lot in there, obviously, because we need to divide up gait analysis for, well, reduce risk of injury, and then we could talk about for performance. But yeah, they're drawing on 2D specifically. Yeah, so 2D, if you take me back as a clinician five, six years ago, um, my standard initial consultation, I used to do a 2D gait analysis on everyone. And then I sat back one day and realized, actually, does everyone actually need it when they, they do, they don't know. And I come to the conclusion, not everyone does need it. I think the history and that, as I said, the history and the load management, trying to then, you can look at that vertical oscillation. You can look at the overstride. You can look at the cadence really well on 2D. So if I've done a, a 3D gait on someone and the thing I want to try and do is improve their, their cadence, uh, will I necessarily mark them back up so they do the gait retraining all the time to, and do the 3D? not all the time. If it's literally cadence, I can just use a metronome and a, and a 2D camera, just, just a normal camera to measure that. I don't need to do that. So definitely 2D does have its, its merits, but it's coming back to always asking the question, what is it that you want to achieve out of doing that gait analysis? So almost have a pre barrier for questions of, this is what I want to look at. This is what I want to try and see. Is this related to that problem? Yes or no, rather just going in blindly of saying okay let's just see what we see because i think if you do that approach you then run the risk of then possibly going down the road of treating the um, scan and not the patient trying to relate it back to injury reduction um some of the academics in the room may know better than i do but my current understanding is trying to relate gait to injury reduction there just isn't any evidence out there to really um support it uh chris i'm gonna braham i think i may have pronounced his surname wrong he published something a while ago looking at um runners who got injured and looking at any patterns and then the daily mail took it for a massive spin and then before you know it's flashed all over the newspaper by saying look scientists have found the way that if you run like this you won't get injured and unfortunately it's not as clear cut as that because we all know injury is so multifactorial just trying to pin it down on gait analysis on its own or the way someone runs I, I, I just can't see how that's going to happen personally still can't okay. hear you Matt oh there Sorry. you are Jess anything you want to add to that yeah I, I just think Nick answered it perfectly and I think maybe that slide that you put up at the at the beginning nick where you showed that the tom goon in, infographic where it shows what you can pick up really well with the 2d and a lot of those are linked with some of the most common running related injuries so as you say if someone comes in and presents with a specific condition and you know that certain risk factors are associated with that then certainly it has its place um, and i think in beginner runners as well you see a lot of that kind of sagittal plane issues the overextended knee the high vertical excursion the low cadence they tend to fit into that pattern of gait which is measurable with with the 2d so yeah it certainly has its role fantastic um any other questions from the floor i've got a whole bunch but ah uh, here we go alice san vito i will unmute you shoot okay hi yes hey, so good. i Hi, good morning or afternoon, everybody. Um, I have a very basic beginner question. Um, you guys all have your heads already steeped into this kind of stuff, but how does a massage therapist who may not know very much about gait analysis um, or a runner who doesn't know about this, how do they know uh, when that would be indicated and to whom would they go for this? Uh, would they get referred to a physical therapist. Um, yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Just very basic beginning question. Yeah, that's yeah, great question. Yeah. Who do we know? Who to? Who does a massage therapist send someone to? One, how do they know when this person needs a gait analysis? And two, how do they know who to send them to? I think for me, when someone needs a gait, and this is just my personal view, as I said, uh, you need to rule out, is there a training load issue? And is there a, a strength related issue first? Because I think that we, we can 
we can back those up with slightly more evidence than we can the case out of training loads and strength deficits and linking those back to injury better than we can and with gait. So for me, it's always making sure those boxes are ticked off first. So I'm making sure they haven't done anything silly with their training and making sure they're doing their regular strength work. And if they are then getting those, if they are doing that and they're still getting their injuries or their injuries keep coming back or their injuries keep coming down one side, then that's when I then look at them and say, okay, um, let's let's look at that, that case analysis as it were. Um, who to refer to? Now, I'm personally, I'm not that sensitive over which type of professional does it. To me, as lo- if you can know what you're talking about and you've got, and you can say, okay, I can do this, I'm fine. I don't care if it's a, a chiropractor, a physio, a podiatrist, a sports therapist, as long as you can understand what you're then looking for, I'm not too fussed. Um, so I think it's more about getting to know the people you want to refer to rather than focusing on the profession um as a such personally um other people may have their different views but um as as a podiatrist i get questioned okay i can't rehab knees or something well i do rehab knees on a on a on a regular basis and i used to work with a physio who if someone phoned up and they had a foot problem they'd either be booked in with me or booked from the physio but we didn't care we just didn't have that that protectiveness over this profession and must be this patient or this type of injury so it's more about the person i think Great. Yeah, that absolutely answered my question. Thank you. No worries. Nice one, Nick. Yeah, very nice. Ticking all my boxes. Jess, anything you want to add to that? Do you, do you have, I mean, obviously you just recommended to somebody who's got run 3D in their clinic. It's very simple for you. <laughs> no, I don't do that. <laughs> no, but I just think, as you say, you build up a relationship with somebody you trust. Um, and that's not a person who's going to put every single patient through a gait analysis if it's not appropriate, right? They need to assess each person with clinical integrity and make the right decision. And that's what they're good at. So. It's one of the advantages of run 3D. I'm presuming that, because one of the problems with gait analysis is, is at the end of the day, it's all about the interpretation, isn't it? You can have as flashy lights as you want. And I've seen my gait analysis go from like, Nick was saying 10 years ago from just a treadmill where we didn't care what treadmill it was. It was just the one we managed to pick up from a gym and it was cheap and, and, and through to different software and systems with lovely lights, ever more incredible ways of picking up data. But at the end of the day, it's the interpretation, isn't it? Of the data, which makes the difference. 100%. And I, I won't lie. When I started on this journey, um, I didn't want to teach clinicians how to interpret the data because I thought, you know, that's, I'm an engineer. That's not, that's not my role. Um, but over time, you know, we've been doing this now for 10 years or so, and we, we do train now and we have come up with kind of a recipe. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of these reports. So actually, as you say, you know, it, it's complicated data and it's a steep learning curve. And so there is a very important aspect of interpretation. So, yeah, it's important. We have um, regular kind of user group meetings and newer newer people can learn from the more experienced ones. So it's, uh, you know, we're still learning all the time as well. You know, there's a huge, we're gathering data from all these clinics and, you know, the idea of applying machine learning on it to help us even better understand these kind of patterns of function is uh, is really appealing as well. So. But yeah, it's it's. I'd say it's the biggest hurdle. The the technology is easy; people get it. Um, but yeah, the interpretation is a much longer a longer learning curve. I was going to ask what you think. I think you answered already. You have regular user meetings, but how stringent are you on ensuring that the interpretation? Because you've got so many clinics now. We were talking earlier on um, across the world, and obviously there's different languages involved. Therefore, but even just like in the UK, how how careful are you? Or how much importance do you place on making sure that the message and the interpretation is similar or do you allow people to go off at their own angles i think we have to let people go off at their own angles there are certain there are certain kind of basic biomechanical maybe we'll call it rules that you know a high anterior pelvic tilt will result in high knee flexion at foot strike and low hip extension at toe off and things like that but because we're working with a range of clinicians we've got podiatrists we've got physiotherapists um, sports therapists sports medicine doctors there are going to be different outcomes based on those results um, also because we don't see the patient that comes through the door right and as Nick has so you know really hammered home a really important part of it is interpreting the data with 
the history and the presentation of that patient that's sat in front of you. So yeah, from a biomechanical, this is related to this and this tends to cause this, um, then that's a little bit more set in stone, but what they do afterwards, um, as you say, tends to be more kind of clinician specific, but we you say we, we hold their hand as much as they want to. That's cool. I'm, I'm surprised there's not giving it as a running conference. I thought there would be more questions from people in the room. Has it been too much now? Have you been so amazed by three presentations and a lunch break with, I think people have got a bit kind of, maybe they're just all gone. It's a bit like school. I need everyone to put their cams on now just to make sure you're actually here. But anyway, yeah, um, I can keep questions going, but oh, I know someone who's going to ask some questions. <laughs> As he leave, could he be more laid back? He'd be falling over if he's more laid back. I just um, got up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Greg. So, have you got any questions at all about gait analysis for Nick and uh, Jess? Can I? Can I have a question? Ask yeah, a question. go for it. It's for you. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. It's about that first case study because I think it was just uh, they said there was a change in the pelvic tilt, but there wasn't a graph showing the change. I was curious. Uh, what actually happened with that person? Yeah, I know that that data is probably old, and you probably don't know offhand. But yeah, the, the first it, it one, the, yeah, the high, the high level athlete. So no, her pelvic. I believe she pelvic, four foot stri strike. Yeah, that one. So was, on one side. It was the pelvic rotation that decreased. In what plane? Um, so trans transverse plane pelvic rotation at foot strike decreased. She had a huge. I don't know if you remember the slide. It was very asymmetric um, on the initial assessment. And then in the gait retraining, whilst she still had that asymmetric foot pattern, I think because she was reducing her overstride, she didn't need to twist as much in order to get that four foot contact. So it's the you mean there was, there no, was no, a drop no, in the front of the plane? No, no, the transverse plane, the twist. So Relative to the lumbar spine? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it was that one. The other guy had a slight improvement in anterior tilt when you showed that graph. Not much. I, I'd argue whether or not that was significant, but there were changes at knee flexion for him and the cadence and things were more, um, were certainly more directly related to the reduction in pain. And then <clears throat> related, Nick was talking about, he inferred uh, someone was a calf dominant runner based on having not a lot of hip extension. Do you yep. remember that? That was the second case? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Can we adequately refer uh, power from uh, kinematic, like hip extension? Uh, no, it, it's just a, it's a term that we've just sort of used in clinic uh, as, as it were. So from a, it's a term I use to try and just get runners to understand what's going on to basically in a nutshell to try and say that from a kinematic viewpoint, you're, not using your hip as much as I would want you to do. So you could be overloading the calf. Obviously, we can't then look at the kinetic. We can't look at actually EMG stuff because I haven't got that that data. But it's just mainly no, no, for the I runs. don't mean from an EMG. I would mean from forces and, and moments and that. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, uh, EMG wouldn't do it. But it, it's for me for more use as an educational tool for the patient to explain, okay, you've got a calf problem, but why do we need to then start doing stuff around the hip? So it's more as an educational thing that we use with patients rather than saying, okay, this is definitely, um, say, if I say, because you're right in that we can't measure that, but it's just a term that I use in clinic. Yeah, I, I'd just be concerned that just because you don't have a lot of hip extension, that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of force production at the hip. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would be my, my only worry there. And you could only tell that from a power analysis. Yes. Because you yeah. could get thigh extension because you can move it at the lumbar spine. Yeah. Right, because your, your hip extension is just femur relative to pelvis. Yes. Correct. Yeah, so I just, that, oh, that's all. I think you'll see lots of fast runners with not a lot of hip extension because they don't have a lot of ground contact time. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think Correct. if you so they pop off the ground. If you looked at his graphs in particular, though, you could see that he was throughout the second half of the stance. He was in much higher plantar flexion, indicating or suggesting that he's pushing more off his ankle than he is driving through his hip. So you can kind of delve a Maybe. bit. Deeper. Yeah. 
into it as well. How much do, I mean, this is going to the one three D people, but Greg, you can jump in maybe like as well. Obviously, I used to but... have this system. This is the same system out of Calgary, right? Reed Ferber system. It's not, it's our system, but it's similar. Yeah. Really? Similar. It looks identical. Yeah, it's no, it's different about, database. Well, it's different, different database. Different oh, you guys software. are competitors. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's fine. But yeah, same it's setup. Fine. So yeah, three. It looks like the same graphs and all the same thing and use of the same terms. I wonder who came first. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> With Across regards the to pond. running injury and running performance, like if we, if somebody is suffering from like a calf issue or something, then we can play around with factors. Maybe if we think that the fact they've got limited hip extension, we can say, well, let's see if we can, let's see what happens if we do introduce a drill where you're actually driving a bit more. And maybe in doing so, that'll stop you from the idea of pushing off um, with plantar flexion at the end, could relax the calf down. This is all good and things we can play around with. But how much does Run 3D get involved with trying to improve performance? Because that's a grayer area, no? It's yes, a <laughs> yes. Oh, goddamn um, gray. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't get involved. <laughs> I think I think Nick's comment on his slide was, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, would certainly come into play there. And we had people, we've had people coming in, and I'm sure lots of you have as well, where they've been reading Runner's World or what have you, and they say, right, my coach says I need to run on my toes. Or I need to run on my midfoot. You're like, no, no, you don't. Have you? Are you injured? Right, no. Let's not <laughs> not change it. Um, and I think, as you say, so from a performance, it's it's great. The science doesn't doesn't back a lot up. So you'd have to be very very careful if you were to do anything. Yeah, it is tricky. Um, it's two forty seven. If anybody else has got any more questions, but don't forget, obviously, these people are going to be available for the Q and A session um, this afternoon. Are you around this afternoon? Are both of you available this afternoon? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wicked. So any more gate-related questions, we won't just be putting it, obviously, to um, Nick and Jess, but we'll be putting it to the 10 speakers. Um, and, um, yeah, so we'll be able to talk about it there during the 90 minutes later on, which I'm very much looking forward to, because it is an integral part of looking after runners, how, when do we get involved, how much do we get involved, busting a few myths, um, do we bust too many myths, um, so yeah, we'll be talking about that. Um, it's two forty-eight. So yeah, what we'll do is we'll call it an end there, um, just to give you an idea of what's coming up. So oh, only Matt Fitzgerald. That's fine. So um, yeah, we're gonna have Matt Fitzgerald live in the house. We're very excited about. Um, that's gonna be at three o'clock, and Matt is gonna be talking about obviously through his own experience. Um, sometimes we have the idea that we shouldn't be training like the elites, and that's just for them. But he's, uh, well, he's kind of shown that if you do train like an elite, you can actually achieve some incredible things. So maybe we should be um, not thinking they're just genetic freaks. Maybe some of the practices they do, we should be concentrating on as well. I'm really looking forward to that. And that'll be coming up at three o'clock. Um, so, yes, yeah, so stick around for that. Um, but Jess and Nick, thank you so much for that. I'm sure there's going to be no, lots of more you. questions later on this afternoon. Um, and uh, after Matt's, we'll come to that. Right, guys. So you're listening to Run Chat Live podcast, putting the evidence back into running injury and performance.